I've looked at how to generate system curves for plain, boring, straight runs of liquid piping. I then looked at what happens when that straight run splits into branches. How do we generate a system curve for that? Now, based on the question from Anthony in the comments of one of those videos, we're going to look at how you generate system curves for systems that contain recycle lines. In all the previous examples, our flow was ever only in one direction. Now with the recycle line, we have a portion of that flow that changes direction and goes back upstream towards the source of our flow. A system curve is a plot of the pressure drop through a system as a function of the flow rate through that system. So the question you need to ask yourself is, which flow? In the previous example I mentioned, we only ever had one flow. With a straight run of pipe, it's whatever the flow is in that pipe. If that flow splits into branches, then yes, each individual branch has its own system curve and its own flow, but I can sum all of those flows together and get the overall system flow and plot the system curve against that. But now with the recycle line, it's a little bit more tricky. There's three different flow rates in a system with one basic recycle. For the rest of this video, I'm going to refer to them by the following three names. First of all, we have the product flow. That's the overall mass balance flow of our system containing the recycle. Then you have the recycle flow, the portion of the flow that downstream in our process decides to change direction and flow back upstream. Then I have what I'm referring to as the pump flow. By mass balance, the pump flow has to equal the product flow and the recycle flow. So the question is when you're building your system curve for the recycle line, which flow are you plotting on your x-axis? Two additional things. The first one is, as always, everything I generate today is going to be available in a spreadsheet that I'm going to put on my drive available for you to download so that you can work through the example yourself. And secondly, I'm giving up on Google Sheets. I thought it was a nice way to share the files with the link in the comments to the videos. But frankly, plotting in Google Sheets is a pain in the ass. Uh, I'm using a, a solver function in Excel. That's what I do in my day to day if I ever need to do these problems. And frankly, the Google Sheets one isn't as good. So I'm going to do all of this in Excel and post a link to that Excel file instead. So it doesn't look great if you open it online, download it rather if you want to look yourself. Our system looks like this. We have a tank with two meters of level. There is a pump pumping out of this tank through a heat exchanger and into another tank with the outlet 10 meters higher than the pump. We then have a recycle line downstream of the heat exchanger back to the pump suction. We have a control valve in this recycle line. Let's label the points to make things easier. A is the base of the tank. B is where the recycle joins our suction line. C is the pump suction and D is the pump discharge. The origin of the recycle line is E and the outlet of our system is F. If we are to build system curves, we need more details. We need to know the full geometry of our system. So let's say that all our lines are four inch, schedule 40. So that gives us the inner diameter. Let's say that portion AB and BC are both 15 meters long. Portion DE, excluding the heat exchanger, and portion EB will both be 20 meters long. Portion EF will be 150 meters long. What about the control valve? Well, let's say that the valve has a linear characteristic with a fully open CV of 60, and we're going to leave it at a constant 45% opening so as not to complicate this too much. Finally, we need to know something about the heat exchanger. Now you could go and look at what kind of heat exchanger it is and try and model it very rigorously. But if I'm faced with this kind of problem in my day-to-day -day work, this is how I'd approach it. I'd go look at the data sheet of the heat exchanger and see what is the calculated design pressure drop at the design flow rate. If you want to understand why you use the calculated and not the allowable pressure drop, you should go see my video explaining why you should actually know equipment pressure drop before you design it. Let's make up some values and say that this heat exchanger was calculated to have a pressure drop of 0.6 bar at a flow rate of 56 cubic meters per hour. Since I know that pressure drop is roughly proportional to the square of the velocity and hence the square of the flow rate, the volumetric flow, 
I can come up with the following equation. And so if I know the design pressure drop and flow, I have a nice equation for the pressure drop through the heat exchanger. And hence I know the system curve of the heat exchanger. It might not be completely accurate and it might be pretty inaccurate at say lower flows, but it's good enough if I have nothing else. To keep things interesting, let's say that we're pumping sulfuric acid instead of water this time. So the SG of sulfuric acid is about 1.8 and the viscosity is higher. Now, if you're asking yourself, what does this process do? And is this a good process design? The answers are, I don't know and probably not. Now I have my geometry and my fluid defined, I'm ready to start building system curves. Here I've got individual system curves for each of the sections we've just described. I'm hoping that if you've come this far and are looking to build recycle line system curves, you don't need this explained to you. But if you do need help, remember you can get access to the file where I construct these curves in the link in the description. Now, one thing I like to do is use the line est function to automatically get the coefficients of any polynomial that's fitted to the system curve. That way, if I change anything like the geometry, say the line length or the line diameter, the coefficients automatically get updated and I use those coefficients to calculate pressure drop elsewhere. Now let's put them all together. We are going to calculate the pressure at each of the points that we've defined as a function of flow rate. Remember I said it's important to know which flow rate we're talking about. So for now, let's talk about the product flow rate. Remember that's the flow rate between points A and B and points E and F. By mass balance, those flows have to be equal. We start with the pressure at A, the base of the tank. The pressure at A is as a result of the two meters of head in the tank. If this were water, two meters would give us about 0.2 bar. Because it's sulfuric acid with a density that's almost double, we almost get 0.4 bar. You could argue that there's some minor exit losses at the tank. That means that the pressure is not independent of flow, but I'm ignoring those in this case. And you can see that the pressure is constant. Next is the pressure at B, the point at which our recycle stream joins. At B, the flow rate is still equal to the product flow rate because we haven't added the recycle flow. So as long as you've taken the elevation of two meters into account, the pressure at B is simply the negative of the value off of the system curve for AB. Next, it would be nice to calculate the pressure at C, but we simply can't do it because we're using the product flow as the basis of our calculation. We don't know what the recycle flow is and hence we don't know the flow rate through portion BC, nor do we know the flow rate through DE at the discharge of the pump. It's only the pressure at point E we can calculate because the flow rate through EF is the product flow rate again after the recycle has branched off. Because point F is at atmospheric pressure, the pressure at E is equal to the pressure drop across EF. So the curve describing the pressure at E is the system curve for EF. And you'll notice that it starts at 1.8 bar because unless I have 1.8 bar, there is no way I can elevate sulfuric acid to a height of 10 meters. But now look at what's happened. I may not know what the recycle flow rate is, but I have a curve describing the pressure at B and I have another curve describing the pressure at E. That means I know the pressure drop between E and B by subtracting one from the other. So if this is the pressure at E and this is the pressure at B, if I subtract these two curves from each other, I get this curve. But understand, this isn't the system curve for EB because I'm not plotting it against the recycle flow. I'm plotting it against the product flow. I am plotting the pressure drop in the recycle line as a function of a flow that doesn't even go into the recycle line. However, that other flow does dictate the pressures on either side of the recycle. So check this out. Now you have two curves for the pressure drop across the recycle line EB. One is as a function of the product flow, meaning the flow not going through the line. And one is as a function of the recycle flow, meaning the stuff that is going through the line. 
Don't worry about the intersection point of these graphs. Because we're plotting two different flow rates on the x-axis, it is of no significance. So what do I do with this? Well, let's say that I have a product flow of 60 cubic meters an hour. That's how much fluid I'm transferring from one tank into the other by mass balance. I go up until I hit the curve that's plotted against product flow and then see what the corresponding recycle flow rate is. So that means I have a recycle flow of 30 cubic meters per hour and the pressure drop across the recycle line is three bar. I can then sum those together and calculate that my pump flow is 90 cubic meters per hour. Now we couldn't be bothered reading off the graphs for every single point. So what I do instead is use the solver function in Excel. You may need to look up how to get the solver function into Excel if you don't already have it. Here are a few columns with the calculations that we have performed up until now as a function of the product flow. I create a new column where I'm going to guess the recycle flow rate. I calculate the pressure drop across the recycle line at the flow rates that I have guessed using the system curve for the recycle line that I've already constructed right at the beginning. Now my goal is to get the flow rate at which the recycle line pressure drop is equal to the pressure drop that I calculated using the product flow for lines AB and EF. You don't need to guess very accurately, your guesses will be wrong. I then create a new column for the error squared, meaning the square of one pressure drop minus the other. I square the value because I only want positive errors, and that's because I'm going to sum all of the errors, and I don't want errors to cancel each other out if I have negative values. The sum of all the errors squared gives me an overall rating for how crappy my guesses were. I then use the solver add-in to ask Excel to minimize the value in the cell for my sum of squares by allowing it to manipulate the cells that contain my recycle flow rate guesses. I run it a few times so that the sum of squares is very low. And voila, I have the recycle flow that corresponds to every single product flow. Here I'm hiding the column with the recycle flow to show you that the two pressure drops are equal and the error is low. Now that I have all the flow rates in my system, I can go back to where I was plotting the pressures of all the points and I can calculate the pressures at C and D using the system curves for the pump suction line and the pump discharge line. Note that again, these are not system curves because system curves show pressure drop through a system as a function of flow through that system. These are simply point pressures, not pressure drops, as a function of one of the flows in our system. I can plot these pressures as a function of product flow, like we have here, or recycle flow, like we have here, or finally against pump flow, like here. You may be asking yourself, what is this gap at the beginning of two of the graphs? Well, the reason we have this gap is because if we look at the results of our solver function, at a product flow rate of zero, I have a recycle flow of 20 minimum. That is because until I have a recycle flow rate of at least 20, the pressure at point E is not high enough to get any flow through my product line up into the second tank. All that would happen at flow rates below 20 cubic meters an hour is that I would have a dead leg in the discharge line into the other tank. The more I increase the recycle, the higher the level in that dead leg would go until eventually I reached a recycle flow of 20 and then I'd get spillover into the tank. Finally, I'd have product flow. Finally, because we have all pressures fully defined as a function of any flow we like, we actually have the differential pressure across the pump by subtracting the pressure at C from the pressure at D. And this is truly the essence of a system curve. Notice that we haven't said anything about what kind of pump we are using, what capacity it has, or anything of that sort. And that is because system curves are independent of the device that drives the flow through that system. 
this curve of the pump differential pressure, i.e. pressure D minus pressure C, is simply a description of how much differential pressure would be required across a pump in order to generate the flow rate through the pump on the x-axis. We can now plot an actual pump curve against this flow. Now for this part, it only makes sense to plot against pump flow, not the other two flows. I've picked a random KSB pump that I found online and the intersection point would be where this particular pump would run on our system as we've defined it. Feel free to put any pump curve you like onto this curve. 